we'll begin to look into the central nervous system. This is going to cover the brain and the spinal cord a little bit as an introduction. Uh, both of these come from two separate chapters, so they're listed as 13 and 14. So the central nervous system does contain both the brain and the spinal cord. And early on in development, as that neural tube is developing, we start to see cephalization of neurons. And so the nervous system itself is starting to coalesce into a larger number of neurons that are beginning to develop towards the head side of the developing embryo. And so this process uh, brings the highest level of consolidation of neurons to the head region itself. And so this process begins relatively early on in development and we start out with what we call primary brain vesicles and these primary ve brain vesicles are the prosencephalon, the mesencephalon, and the rhombencephalon. Each one of these is the forebrain, the midbrain, and the highbrain as well depending upon who you're reading and those are going to be the first kind of outpouchings of the neural tube. So the neural tube begins as our beginning point for the nervous system, kind of the most primitive of the nervous system itself and then we're going to start to differentiate from here on out as we kind of move along through development itself those prosencephalon mesencephalon and rhombencephalon are going to further differentiate and the secondary brain vesicles are going to start to to develop at week five of embryonic development and so at week five the the different regions are going to get further and closer in towards their adult form we're going to move on to the telencephalon and diencephalon coming from the prosencephalon. We have the mesencephalon, the metencephalon, uh, and the myelencephalon. The mesencephalon stays the same essentially, and so the midbrain is going to stay the same pretty much through the entire development itself. The metencephalon and the uh, myelencephalon are going to develop from the rhombencephalon, and the metencephalon is also going to give rise to the pons. <clears throat> So here we have a five-week-old embryo in development. Those different regions now are going to start to de develop into the final brain structures of the adult. And so the telencephalon is going to give rise to essentially what we think of as the brain when somebody talks about the brain. This is the cerebrum. Um, so this is going to be all the cerebral region of the brain itself. It's going to surround eventually the diencephalon. And so the diencephalon is going to get surrounded by the telencephalon. So we have our thalamus, hypothalamus, and epithalamus kind of uh, deep inside the brain. And then extending from the diencephalon, we then have the mesencephalon, the metencephalon, and myelencephalon developing into the midbrain, the pons, and then extending off of the pons, the cerebellum, and the myelencephalon to the medulla oblongata. And so we have this differentiation that occurs. Uh, within the development all the way from that beginning neural tube. <clears throat> so with this structure, we've seen all along that there, there was kind of this blue stuff in the center of the uh, neural tube and then the primary vesicles and the secondary vesicles themselves. And that open space that's inside there, that blue portion, is what's going to become the ventricles of the brain. And so as we can see where we started out with a neural tube, and so the neural tube was essentially just a tube of nervous tissue, and it was filled in with cerebrospinal fluid as well. And then we had essentially just the, the nervous tissue around it. And that was our beginning point. And from there, we then developed into all the adult structures themselves. And so the telencephalon gave rise to the cerebrum, and as it, it kind of continues to grow out and around here as the, the cerebrum, it's going to cover over the diencephalon. But those openings of the ventricles are basically going to stay. And so the lateral ventricles become inside the telencephalon or the cerebrum. The third ventricle develops in between the two sides of the diencephalon so we have our thalamus hypothalamus and epithalamus in this tissue here and the space that's in between is the third ventricle 
that then drains down through the mesencephalon, which then gets us into the fourth ventricle, which lies in between the pons primarily and the cerebellum, and then a little bit of the myelencephalon or the mandula oblongata, and then it finally drains down through to the central canal and then drains all the way through the spinal cord itself. The nervous tissue of the central nervous system is a delicate substance. And so the tissues that are there, the cells that are there are in need of quite a bit of protection from all kinds of things. And so essentially the initial protection that we have would be the hair on the top of our head and then the skin, um, any muscle that is there, and then the bone, and then deep to the bone, we then have the meninges. And so we have these structures that are going to surround the brain and the spinal cord themselves. There are three types. We have dura mater, arachnoid mater, and then we have pia mater. And so each one is going from the dura mater in towards the pia mater. Uh, we get, in a sense, kind of uh, less and less protection so to speak, from the different layers. And so the dura mater is very strong. It's very leathery in terms of its appearance. Uh, it takes a lot to get through it. The arachnoid matter is more of kind of like, almost like a plastic wrap that surrounds the brain. Um, it's a relatively thin and, and somewhat delicate portion. And then the pia mater is even more delicate than that of the arachnoid matter. It's even thinner. Um, and it essentially kind of hugs the brain. It clings to the brain matter itself. And so whereas the dura mater and the arachnoid mater just kind of go on the outside of the brain, something like so, they do go down into fissures of the brain and get deep inside. The pia mater actually goes down into all of the little sulci. And so it goes down deep into all the different portions of the brain itself and covers every little bit of brain that we have. And so it's covering everywhere that is there versus the other two. They don't actually make themselves down into the sulci. They're going to stay out on the surface themselves. From there, we then have the extensions of the dura mater. So the dura mater is a double layer of tissue. And with that, when it folds in on itself to get into the fissures, it becomes quite thick. And we have these little extensions that are there. <clears throat> so we have a falx cerebri. Um, this is going to be running along the longitudinal fissure. So we have this one here. We then have a uh, separation between the cerebellum and the cerebrum. And this is our tentorium cerebelli. And then lastly, there's a falx cerebelli. And this is going to essentially kind of separate the two hemispheres of the cerebellum. And in this particular picture, we can't see it there. So here we can see all of the different layers of protection. We have our skin, we have a little bit of connective tissue there, we have the bone, and then we get down finally into the dura mater. And so the dura mater has a layer that goes right up against the bone. And so this is the periosteal layer. And then it has a layer that is right next to, in a sense, the arachnoid matter. And that would be our meningeal layer. The purple layer there is the arachnoid, and then the red is our pia mater. A little bit different picture. This one shows a little bit better kind of how the pia mater goes down deep into all of the sulci, and the arachnoid matter and dura mater stay right on the surface. Here we can see the falx cerebri. We can see, once again, the tentorium cerebelli, that dividing line between where the cerebrum and the cerebellum are. And then now we can see where the falx cerebelli is as well. And so we have the separation of the two hemispheres for the cerebellum there. Those meninges are there for essentially kind of keeping things out of the nervous system itself, but they do sometimes fall prey to viruses and bacteria and even fungi. Uh, that is there. And so one of the ways to diagnose is simply through the symptoms, which is oftentimes headache, um, stiff neck, pain upon moving the neck and things like that. 
um, because the virus or bacteria is literally attacking the meninges themselves. And so we're getting lots of inflammation that's inside there. If it spreads out of the meninges and spreads deeper in towards the tissues, we can start to get encephalitis as well. The definitive diagnosis comes from a lumbar puncture to draw out CSF, so to get the fluid that's inside there. And it's done in the lumbar spine because as we'll see later on, the lumbar spine doesn't have a solid cord. It just has the cauda equina here, which are just individual little fibers rather than a solid structure. The spinal cord in the brain, when we look at it, we have some distinctive kind of areas that we can see. And so the spinal cord is really easy to see the difference between white matter and gray matter, uh, simply because the white matter is all kind of on the outside, the gray matter is on the inside, and where the gray matter is, it makes up kind of a uh, H pattern. And so we're gonna see something like the cord looking like so, and then the gray matter inside looks something like that. And so white matter is all on the outside, gray matter is on the inside. For the brain, it flips. We're going to have gray matter on the outside and white matter on the inside. And kind of embedded within all of the white matter in different areas, there's going to be some gray matter nuclei. There's gonna be some areas where we have extra kind of uh, gray matter embedded within. The cerebellum is quite like that of the cerebrum in that it again has gray matter on the outside and then it has the white matter on the inside making up the arbor vitae. So here we can see the spinal cord nicely here where we have the spinal cord giving that shape of a H pattern or kind of a butterfly pattern uh, for the tissues themselves that are there. The cerebellum, this one doesn't really give a, a good uh, differentiation there, but the gray matter is on the outside and the white matter is on the inside for that cerebellum. An image of the gross brain. And so we have a dissected brain here. We can see this outer cortex here, just kind of the darker tissue that's on the outside is all of the gray matter. And then everything that is in this way is all white matter. But there are still some gray matter nuclear regions here where we've got a whole bunch of cell bodies inside there. This is also a good picture to get an idea of what the ventricles look like. And so here we have the lateral ventricles and you can see how they kind of open up inside the cerebrum itself. And so they're gonna run all the way from the anterior side here, all the way to the posterior side. And so it has an anterior horn and a posterior horn and an inferior horn all running along that lateral ventricle. The gray matter is gray because it pretty much doesn't have any myelinated fibers. So they're gonna have cell bodies, the soma. They're gonna have unmyelinated processes. So all of our, our unmyelinated fibers that are there and then a large number of neuroglial cells, and so all of our protective cells that are there. In general, the gray matter and white matter will have connections between the two halves of either the brain or the spinal cord, and when we, where we have those, we have what we call commissures, and so we can have a gray commissure here in the uh, brain and spinal cord themselves, and so in the, the spinal cord, that gray commissure connects the two halves of the the H portion, so it's kind of the, the part that crosses a, across it. And then we have an anterior horn and a posterior horn, and those anterior horn and posterior horns are divided up into um, different types of information. The anterior horn being motor, and the posterior horn being sensory. And so, and this is what the way that kind of the central nervous system is going to be divided up in general, is that we're going to see the sensory on the posterior side and the motor on the anterior side. The lateral horns we see right in here and those lateral horns we're only going to find in areas where we have sympathetic nerve fibers. And so those sympathetic nerve fibers are, are going to be find a found along the thoracic spinal cord. <clears throat> and then we have our dorsal horn and then we have the anterior horn. 
The dorsal horn is relatively easily distinguished because the dorsal horn goes all the way out to the edge of the white matter. So it makes its way all the way out to the very edge versus the anterior horn, there's a gap. We have space in between the end of the gray matter and the outside edge of the cord. The ventricles take a little bit deeper look at the the ventricles themselves and so the ventricles have the lateral ventricles we have the third ventricle and then we have the fourth ventricle connecting the third and fourth ventricles we have the uh, cerebral aqueduct and that's going to connect those two the lateral ventricles as we started to see on the gross image of the the brain uh, the lateral ventricles are quite large and so the lateral ventricles are pretty big structures. Uh, they have with them an anterior horn, a posterior horn, and then an inferior horn within them. Those lateral ventricles drain into the third ventricle. The third ventricle here lies in between the diencephalon. So this is in between the thalamus, the hypothalamus, and the epithalamus. And with the diencephalon, we also have a connection of gray matter and so within the thalamus we have the space there that creates an empty space for the thalamic adhesion that connects the two sides of it together the entire cerebral hemisphere is relatively large and so it makes up some 80 plus percent of the entire mass of the brain itself and in order to fit basically all of those individual cells there, this is why the brain has ridges and grooves and ridges and grooves. And so we've got our sulci and we've got our gyri. And so the sulcus is the space in between and the ridges are the gyri. And so that's going to increase our surface area. That's going to make it so that we have a lot more uh, cells to be able to function in all of the processing that the brain needs to be able to do. The two hemispheres themselves, we've mentioned before, are separated by the longitudinal fissure. So the longitudinal fissure is going to go relatively deep and then come back up. And then we begin the other hemisphere on the other side. Uh, that's there. And so this is going to be right along the sagittal plane. We're going to see that longitudinal fissure that is there. When we look at the, the brain itself in the models and, and the actual brain, we'll see that it's divided up into something similar to what we saw in bones. And so we have five different lobes. We have a frontal lobe, a parietal lobe, a temporal lobe, occipital lobe, and an insula. And so the first four are similar to the bones that we had uh, for the skull itself. The fifth one there, the insula, is kind of hidden by the frontal, parietal, and temporal bones. And so in order to be able to actually see the insula, we've got to be able to uh, remove those portions of the brain and see deep inside the insula itself. Between the frontal lobe and the parietal lobe, so kind of something like so, exaggerated there a little bit, um, we have what we call the central sulcus. And so that central sulcus is a sulcus that appears on the brain. And so we've got other sulci that are here. The central sulcus is an important one though, because it's the, the dividing line between the frontal lobe and the parietal lobe. And it's also important because it's the one sulcus that goes all the way from the longitudinal fissure down to the lateral sulcus. So it's also going to be the dividing line there between motor and sensory information in the gyri that are there. Other sulci that we have, we have the parieto occipital sulcus, somewhat difficult to see on things like models. We have the lateral sulcus, relatively easy to be able to find. And then the pre and post central gyrus are on either side of that central sulcus. And so here we have the central sulcus itself. 
making its way all the way down to the the lateral sulcus there so that central sulcus is going to come all the way down here this precentral gyrus is going to house motor information the postcentral gyrus is going to house sensory information as we have the two there um yep, we have the different air uh, sulci here as well and so we have the frontal lobe the parietal lobe the occipital lobe the two hemispheres are separated by the longitudinal fissure the frontal lobe and parietal lobes are then separated by the central sulcus and so that's going to separate those two the parietal lobe and the occipital lobe separated by the parietal occipital sulcus on the side we have the lateral sulcus so this is kind of in between the the temporal lobe and that of the parietal and frontal lobes uh, providing for that space that's in there as well and then we also have the transverse fissure here which is going to go in between the occipital lobe and the cerebellum the insula as i said we were going to have to remove essentially part of the frontal lobe part of the parietal lobe and then part of the temporal lobe in order to be able to see the insula itself and so in order to to get that visual there we have to remove part of the cerebrum in order to see it underneath. the just the outer portion of gray matter that we had so whereas the cere cerebrum itself makes up some 80 percent of the brain uh nearly half of the entire brain mass is just out in that gray matter portion that's there and it's in that gray matter portion where essentially we have all of the um processing for information that's coming in and going out of the brain itself is happening all just out in that cortex that we have there when we look at what the two hemispheres themselves can do though we find that the two of them aren't equally in their function and so they're not processing the same kinds of information on both sides with the exception of sensory information for the most part especially general senses and that of the motor speaking of sensory and motor we have sensory information and motor information that's going to come from the cerebrum themselves and so on the motor side we control voluntary movement so this is all skeletal muscle sensory information we have conscious information that's coming in and once that conscious information gets in we have to send it over to association areas these association areas are in a sense kind of like putting label on things and so it kind of comes down to why do you call the sky blue and that's simply because somebody told you that it was blue so it's not chair it's not table it's blue um, it's not even red or green or things like that at least most of the time um, and so these association areas are kind of all of that past information that we've come across that we utilize to process the new sensory information that's coming in. So we learn kind of from the past history as well. And we can see that when it comes to sensory information, essentially the posterior half of the cortex is dedicated to that. The anterior portion is motor. And so we have our premotor cortex and our premotor and our uh, primary motor cortex within the anterior portion. Our conscious sensation information is being done by our somatic sensory, and this is all in the post central gyrus. Primary motor cortex is just within the premotor cortex, and so that's in the 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 area where we're going to develop the ability to move and things like that and then all of our special senses taste vision hearing here uh, within the the brain itself all have kind of their own special function in terms of the area where we're going to process that information that's coming in smell is deep within and we can't really see it in this particular picture uh, but we can see the olfactory areas here as they're found kind of on the underside of the temporal lobe so for processing information we'll get into these deeper in the next lecture 
but for processing information, we have motor areas that are essentially our primary motor cortex is the final plan for what we're going to move. Premotor cortex is developing that plan. And then when it comes to Broca's area and the frontal eye fields, these are specialized motor areas specifically for speech when it comes to Broca's area. And for the frontal eye field, this is helping to coordinate the movement of the two eyes. On the sensory side of things, we have our primary somatosensory information. This is essentially where did it happen on the body and what kind of sensation was it? Was it light touch, deep touch, pain, um, an itch? What kind of information was coming in through that somatosensory area? And then we send it over to association cortex. The association cortex is, again, putting the labels on things figuring out what it is, have we touched it before, have we smelled it before, things like that for all of that information. Each of the special senses has their own specific primary area. And so we have visual primary, we have auditory primary areas that come in, and then we send those that information off to visual association, auditory association, and so on. And that then processes and puts the label to the thing that we've seen, heard, smelled, tasted, whatever it happens to be. <clears throat> the gray matter and white matter within the, the brain and the spinal cord themselves, we have kind of the, the specific patterns that we talked about as far as the cord goes. And so we have our gray matter making up somewhat of an H pattern, almost sometimes looks like a butterfly that's there and that's on the inside for the spinal cord the white matter is all myelinated fibers because it has all of those lipids that are there that makes it more white in terms of its coloration that is there uh, for those the cortex of the brain makes up all of the gray matter and so we have gray matter that is there the brain has a big white matter connection called the corpus callosum and then the spinal cord here has a big gray matter connection that's going to connect the two halves as well. And this is the gray commissure. The spinal cord itself runs all the way from the frame and magnum down to about L1, L2. So typically somewhere in that area, depending upon the, the length of the torso of the person is going to dictate where that occurs. Uh, but for the most part, it gets done at about L1, and that's where we end the actual solid cord that we have. The spinal cord's job is send information up towards the brain and send information down towards the cord from the brain. And so it's a kind of a two-way process. Sensory information goes in and goes up towards the brain. Motor information comes down from the brain towards the cord to the eventual spinal nerves that they're going to exit with. Similar to that of the brain, they have the same meninges. So we have the dura mater, arachnoid, and pia mater again. It's protected by bone, relatively large amount of muscle for the most part. Um, and then we've got the CSF inside there as well. So we can see that the, the actual cord here begins at the foramen magnum, comes down to about L1. And so it's going to end at that point there. And that's where the actual cord itself stops. The cord has two areas where it kind of swells. And so we have this cervical enlargement and we have this lumbar enlargement. And this is going to be there to accommodate the extra nerve fibers coming and going from the upper extremities and the lower extremities that we have there. The actual cord ends here at the conus medullaris. So if we were to look at the cord kind of coming down it comes down and then it's going to come down to kind of a point, the conus medullaris. From there, we're going to have all kinds of nerve fibers extending down from it. And all of those nerve fibers then come together to become the cauda equina. And so the cauda equina is going to be that whole um, collection of fibers as it comes down. So we can see the cauda equina extending down from that L1 all the way down to the rest of the coccyx that's there.
Here we can see the different coverings for the meninges. And so we have dura mater on the outside. So that's this portion here as it's kind of unwrapping the cord per se. We then have the arachnoid matter. And then lastly, we have the pia mater covering intimately over the actual cord itself. The pia mater does have some special extensions that come out the side here. These are what are referred to as denticulate ligaments. And these are going to help to kind of anchor the cord side to side. Those are going to extend all the way out to the vertebral bone and actually anchor the cord within the vertebrae themselves. So once again, the conus medullaris is the very end of the cord, typically around L1. That pia mater does have the denticulate ligaments. And so we have these denticulate ligaments that extend out on the sides, but it also has the phylum terminale. And the phylum terminale is going to come out of the conus medullaris, and it's going to extend down from the conus medullaris all the way down to the coccyx. And so we're going to have all of the nerve fibers extending out with it. And so all of the conus, med uh, the conus medullaris is giving off all of those nerve fibers, and we're becoming the cauda equina. And these are all going to go down with... And then some of them are going to come out to start to leave the cord at times. But the phylum terminale is going to run with them and eventually embed into the coccyx at the lower end. So here we can see the phylum terminale is a little bit wider there in the structure of coming off of the conus medullaris. And then we have the cauda equina for the rest of the tissues there. The spinal cord itself, as we count down from the cervicals all the way down to the uh, coccyx, we have 31 pairs of nerves. We have more than what we actually have of the vertebrae. And so we're going to have an extra cervical nerve that is going to be found. And that extra cervical nerve occurs in between the C1 and the occipital bone. And so we have one extra nerve that's going to occur there and come out so rather than having seven like the bones we have eight we talked about the cervical and lumbar enlargements um, that providing the extra connections for the sensory and motor coming from the upper extremities and the lower extremities and then all of the cauda equina being the nerve roots as they extend down from the conus medullaris the spinal cord has two deep grooves in it as well and so those deep grooves are the posterior median sulcus and the anterior median fissure. And so just like with the, the brain, the sulcus is shallower and a little bit less uh, wide as that of the anterior median fissure. And so those are going to run there. And the pia mater is going to go down deep into the fissure and sulcus as well. And so it will extend down into there. We can also see here the denticulate ligaments coming off of the cord. And so that's extending out from the pia mater and helping to anchor the cord on the sides. And next up, we'll talk about the brain and the spinal cord more specifically.